unsaturated, polysaturated, monosaturated, polyunsaturated. If all you just heard was onomatopoeia gobbledygook, this episode is for you. We are talking about fat. Heart disease is the number one killer of Americans. Normally, it kills 650,000 of us a year, but 2020 was special and that number was 700,000, double the number of COVID deaths. So does eating fat make you fat? Does fat lead to heart disease? These were questions that my next guest set out to answer. Before getting her master's at Harvard, or excuse me, at Oxford, she studied biology at Yale and Stanford and majored in American studies. Later, the pre-med student turned journalist was writing for Gourmet Magazine when her editor assigned her to a story about trans fats. But what she discovered played out more like a true crime saga with big personalities, cover-ups, and payoffs. After 10 years of research, she chronicled all of it in her best-selling uh, book called the big fat surprise. Today, she's going to shed some light on the confusing lingo around heart health, the sketchy policy origins, and give us an up-close look at some very revealing research. Author of The Big Fat Surprise, seeker of truth, and lover of logic, Nina Teicholtz. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So here's a question I feel like people may have, maybe thinking right away. You're a journalist, former pre-med student, but not a medical doctor. So in order to allow our listeners to really absorb the data that you've spent so much time collecting, why should we listen to you about heart disease versus the information our doctor is giving us? Well, that's a good question. Um, and I think the, the route that I took into my research, I, which was I spent a research period that lasted almost a decade to write my book um, was really through nutrition. How does how does diet affect our not just heart disease but our overall health? And that is an area that doctors really don't know almost anything about. Um, I discovered because they teach maybe one day of nutrition in medical school, and otherwise they're really taught how to prescribe pills, other kinds of medications, but nutrition is not part of their training, which is extremely sad, I think, from the perspective uh, of the fact that there's now a huge body of science to show that changing your diet can actually reverse metabolic diseases. But it just means that there's this kind of vacuum, an area where doctors don't study it, and, um, and, and so there's space for journalists to, to sort of come in and, and to do the work that, that really hasn't been done, which is a kind of a rigorous look at what the science says on nutrition and health. And you don't accept any uh, financial support from any interested parties or companies right, so, or industries. Yeah. Why is that important? So important point. So one of the important points is that I do not receive any money from industry and never have. And I don't receive any money. There's a nonprofit that I run. We don't receive any money from industry. So um, I've tried um, and I have I remained as squeaky clean as possible, um, which is hard because I've been offered many shares in startups that are now, <laughs> now worth, I don't know, billions. But um but the other thing I, I think it's important for people to know, especially as we go on in our conversation, is that I really had no preconceptions about diet at all. I was your average kind of not educated eater, except for what I knew were two things. Don't eat red meat and don't eat butter and, and minimize the cheese and eat low fat whenever possible. So that's what I knew going into the beginning of this journey which dramatically changed during the course of my, my investigations, but it really changed because I, I, I read the science and, and came to understand that some of the things that I thought were true really were not supported by the evidence. Well, I can't wait to get into uh, the, when you started digging into research, what you uncovered, it was one of the most surprising things to me was your process of finding the information and the pushback that you got. But we'll get to that soon. Let's start with some definitions. So first, what is heart disease exactly? Well, heart disease is sort of is an umbrella term that is used, and I think its most common understanding is atherosclerosis, which is not an easy word to say, but that is 
What, what is the buildup of plaque in your arteries? That's what most people think of when they think of heart disease, but there are actually various other kinds of heart disease that include um, ischemic heart disease, which is when there's reduced um, blood flow to the ox to all your organs. There's cardiomyopathy, which is a deteriorate, deterioration of the heart muscle. Um, there's inflammatory heart disease, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle. And there's also kind of um, all body um, reduction in your ability to your circulatory ability. And that is due to high blood pressure and it's called hypertensive heart disease. So all these things are under this umbrella term of, of heart disease. And also I would say stroke is probably, you know, closely enough related to heart disease that it's often included in analyses of heart disease. And what about polysaturated, polyunsaturated, monosaturated? Like, talk to me <laughs> with definitions. Pretend for a moment that it is a bar and, like, it's last call and I'm still sitting there and someone needs to drive me home. Like, give me that version of the definition. Like, I'm really drunk and a little dumb. <laughs> okay. All right, you um, dumb, drunken people out there. Um, <laughs> So what polyunsaturated, so fats, all fats come in different forms, all right? And it has to do with the structure of the chemical molecules, like, um, and almost all foods contain all kinds of, of fatty acids. If vegetable oils are largely, so I'm talking about soybeans, sunflower, canola oil, um, all those oils that you use, nearly all of them are what's called polyunsaturated fats. And the poly just means that it has multiple double bonds. And the only thing you have to know about that is that all those double bonds, they can break open, especially when they're heated, and bond with oxygen. And so oxygen is what creates oxidation and leads to inflammation, and that's bad. You do not want that happening in your body. That's why you eat antioxidant foods. Um, so then there's something called monounsaturated fats, which is mono means just one double bond, so only one opportunity to open up and bond with oxygen. That's mainly olive oil. So that's why olive oil is, from a perspective of oxidation, a little healthier than the poly mini double bond vegetable oils. And then finally, there's what we think is the worst fat, which is saturated fat. The saturated just refers to the fact that it has no double bonds. So no opportunity to bond with oxygen. So ironically, it, it is actually the most stable fat. Um, and it won't oxidize and it's safer to cook with, which is, I know it went out upside down. Now you're like, I need to go home because uh, <laughs> my, my brain can't handle this upside down world you're telling me. But um, it turns out that saturated fats are the most stable and therefore the best for cooking. Okay, so I'm gonna, I like, um, uh, what is it called? Alliteration. So saturated, safe, it's a generalization, but it works for me and I can remember it. Saturated, sa safe, poly, equals ox oxidized, and I don't have a word, a P word to go with that, but I'll work on it, I'll work on it. How about plenty of oxidation? Oh, bam, there we go. Okay, poly, plenty <laughs> of oxidation, saturated, safe. Okay, so heart disease. There weren't a lot of cases noted before the 1900s. How do we know that those cases of heart disease were just simply undocumented and that they existed? Yeah, this is a good question because uh, what you go back, when you go back and, and look at the medical literature in the early 1900s and even in the middle of the 18, you know, the 19th century, so in the 1800s, there were scientists studying heart disease. There were, there were textbooks on heart disease. They had seen it. They knew what it looked like. They knew its manifestations, but they weren't seeing it show up in hospitals. So even in Mass General, a big hospital in a big city, they were not seeing cases of heart disease or very few cases, just like a handful during the course of a year. Um, and these were, you know, by the doctors who were leaders in the field that just did not see these cases. So by the 1920s, however, the late 1920s, heart disease had risen to become the number one killer in the nation, especially of men. 
It was men who got heart disease originally, which is kind of an interesting little known fact because it wasn't until uh, maybe the 90s that, that, it, that it really evened out in terms of killing both men and women almost equally. So there really was not heart disease. Um, in fact, there were no cardiologists. There were no doctors who specialized in heart disease until the late 1920s. So, um, so what brought all of this into like the consciousness of the nation was that President Eisenhower himself had a heart attack in 1955. Um, and we can go into that if you want, but that really focused the attention of the whole nation on the fact that a young, youngish, middle-aged man could get heart disease, and often they died. So before 1920, heart disease was still detectable, is what you're saying? Recognized, identified, detectable, but rare. But rare. Okay. So it's not that they didn't have the instruments to detect heart disease. The instruments, the instruments did become more sophisticated, but there were still ways, there was, it used to be, there was always the, the pain in the chest that would precede it. Um, they would be able to, they had some of the instrumentation. So I think there was a sense that they could detect heart disease. And of course, there were autopsies that were, that were done um, in order to try to detect heart disease. So I think there was a fair sense that, I mean, there was, you know, there's a book in Scotland, for instance, it, all the way up, I think, in the 1930s, where they said we just had by a man who was highly skilled in, in uh, learned, learned about heart disease. And he said, we just have no cases in Northern Scotland. So it was very rare. Okay. You mentioned in another interview that the heart health hypothesis is the most studied hypothesis in nutritional history. And yet there are stacks and stacks and stacks of studies showing that it is not... Uh, not not true. Um, how did a, a hypothesis that has been proven not true become institutionalized? Okay, this is a little bit of a long answer. <laughs> so you're talking about the diet heart hypothesis. It was proposed by a professor named Ansel Keys uh, in the late 1950s, and it, the hypothesis was that saturated fats and dietary cholesterol, so eating eggs, red meat, cheese, would cause your, your cholesterol in your body to rise. In those days, it was only total cholesterol that they measured. And that would sort of clog your arteries like you know hot oil going down a cold stove pipe and give you a heart attack and you would die. And that was this idea. That became enshrined as official policy by the American Heart Association in 1961. So that's the first time anywhere in the world that an organization is telling the public, do not or cut back dramatically on saturated fat and cholesterol in order to prevent heart disease. That was the first time that people started saying, cut back on red meat, cut back on full fat dairy, uh, cut back on eggs, shellfish, anything with cholesterol and saturated fats. So now it's policy. Well, it, it's very powerful when something becomes policy, there's a tremendous um, disinclination to back off a policy, right? You don't want to be seen as wrong. You don't want to be seen as potentially having harmed people by, by giving them this advice. And at that time in 1961, there was only a shred of evidence that this was actually true. I mean, when I say a shred, there was a large study, but it was a very, a very low quality evidence. It's called the Seven Country Study, and you can look it up and read a lot about, about that study, and it's also in my book. But then governments around the world tested this hypothesis in more rigorous kind of studies called controlled clinical trials. This is what we did, you know, to, um, for every drug. Any drug that you can get out of the pharmacy it has to go through a clinical trial. And so this is the rigorous kind of evidence that policy needs. So there were all these experiments on some 75,000 people all over the world in Finland, Australia, the UK, the US, mostly in the US, testing to see if people who, if there would be two groups, one group would eat saturated fat, regular milk, regular cheese, regular meat, and the other group would have soy filled cheese, soy filled milk, whatever the impossible burger version of then was, they would eat that. And at the end of all those experiments, they could not, they universally could not find that saturated fats 
eating more of them had any impact on your likelihood of dying from cardiovascular disease, from a heart attack, from, from any kind of heart disease. And most of the studies showed it didn't affect events. It didn't affect heart attacks. It didn't affect myocardial infarction or anything like that. And in, mo in mo many of these studies, about a dozen of them, it showed that people who were on the vegetable oil diet died at higher rates from cancer, which was extremely upsetting and disturbing and was taken very seriously um, when these results came out. But ultimately, all of these results were, um, but they became what's sort of known as like silent science. They were forgotten, they were ignored, the papers weren't published, papers lay in the basements of buildings, data tapes went unanalyzed. I mean, there's really a very rich history of how all this data was somehow just ignored. So what happened was, is that there was kind of a renaissance of interest, partly due to my book, and also there's book, been um, books by others, but about 10 years ago, scientists all over the world started to look back at this forgotten data, these forgotten studies. Um, Again, 76,000 people tested. That is the most tested hypothesis in nutrition in the history of nutrition. And these papers, which have looked again at this whole body of knowledge, have come up with this universally, again, the same answer, that eating more, that reducing your saturated fat, cutting back on red meat and dairy and all of that has no benefit for cardiovascular mortality. And I also have to say, or total mortality, which means death from any cause. So, you know, we're in a situation now where there are now some 20 of these review papers that have been published in the last decade. I just participated in the publication. I was an author on one of the most recent papers on this. And, but it's, it's like knock, knock, knock at the door of the policymakers who just can't hear it, can't see it. Um, we actually, there were actually like high level experts in nutrition, some of the leading nutrition experts in the field went to talk to people who run the government policy on nutrition and said, look, you have to consider the latest data on this subject. And it's just like a, a just kind of a blockout on this on this most recent science. It's it's a it's a very strange chapter in the history of, of nutrition science or I think really any kind of science. I would agree that that has been really the most surprising thing to me because, you know, I was born in the 80s. Um, I remember my mom uh, used to cook liver and um, I don't have memories of liver, but she told us, yeah, we, we were cooking liver and then we learned it was unhealthy. So, you know, it was low fat, everything in the fridge. So what you're saying is historically a college professor started this. He and his colleagues, I mean, to be fair, and he what he himself was a very forceful individual. He was, he it was known to argue anyone to the death, according to his colleagues. He had an unshakable confidence in his own beliefs. He believed he was right until proven wrong, which is sort of the opposite of what science says. Science says you are, you, you never know if you're right and you should always be self-doubting and self-questioning. Um, but he sort of, he acted in the opposite way. So he was this extremely forceful man and he birthed this idea into the world in a very, very strong way. After that, it's fair to say it was adopted by various institutions, including our National Institutes of Health, the American Heart Association. So now you have it, it's institutionalized, it's embraced by bureaucracies. Do bureaucracies like to change? No, <laughs> they don't like to change. People's careers are based on trying to prove this hypothesis right. So it's embedded in the scientific community. And then of course, there are all the interests of the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, there's a web of interests, vested interests in keeping this policy and, and this hypothesis alive. That's a really good way to word that, a web of vested interest. And Ansel Keys himself, clearly had vested interest, but oversaw many of the studies, potentially making the studies maybe less accurate? Well, that's an interesting, you know, normally what happens in these studies and what happened to the major ones is that they weren't, they, they did, investigators really did try their best and they were well, many of these were very well done. Some of them were, um, had problems here and there, but what happened mainly to them is that when the results came out, they were so, the investigators who believed so strongly 
in their ideas that they were they just couldn't accept the results. So I'll give you one example. One, one of the largest tests ever conducted, it was, it was done in five Minnesota mental hospitals, the kind of experiment you can't do now because it's considered unethical. Ansel Keys was one of the original authors on that paper. He dropped off. Um, and, then, and then another author, they, they got their results and they didn't publish them for 17 years, which is, um, you know, not that's not really... I wouldn't say legal, but I mean, that's not according to pro protocol in science. You're supposed to publish your results. And when they did publish them finally and were asked by a journalist, why did you not publish them for so long? The lead investigator, Ivan France, said, well, there was nothing wrong with our experiment. We were just so disappointed in the way it came out. How, it, how is this science? I, it is so confusing for us because, and disempowering, when people hear this sort of thing, you know, at first we lean in because it's like salacious gossip we've never heard. And then we end feeling so confused and we, you know, we go to the fridge and we pull out what we bought at the store and we don't even know what is life anymore. It's so disheartening. It is. It's disheartening. And I think it's very disorienting. I mean, my process in writing my book was on almost a nightly basis laying down the f on the floor and saying, this can't be right. I can't be right. I must be wrong. I have to, I have to figure out what, you know, what I did that was not correct. And I couldn't figure out, a, I couldn't figure out any other explanation. But it's, and now that my book has been out for a while and I've seen the arguments, you know, against it, I know that that what I've written ha is 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 true because I haven't seen any arguments that really challenge it. And in fact, the science that's come out since then has just has just supported it more and more and more. But I think it is it's almost like an existential question that we all face, which is how do we trust the authorities whom we want to believe? You know, no one likes to walk around questioning every single thing, like. Is this bottle of water okay? Is this, you know, I mean, I won't even say the obvious ones, but you know, can I hold up my phone to my ear without getting brain cancer? I mean, I just don't know. Yeah. I, I think it's very hard. And for me, you know, knowing that it, it took me 10 years of research to understand what I understand now about one tiny little subject, um, how many other subjects are there out there? It has changed a lot. Um, I, it really has changed my worldview about my ability to trust authorities, um, which is you, which is not my habit. <laughs> um, so, so I think it's very hard to to reckon with this information. But, but if you're somebody who is fighting any kind of metabolic condition like heart disease, um, diabetes, type one or type two, obesity, hypertension, fatty liver disease. I mean, there is an obligation to reckon with this, uh, this alternative view of the science because, because when somebody's health is at stake, it's just too important to, to, to ignore. I agree. And that's, I, from what I understand, part of your work with the Nutrition Coalition Right, yes. to change policies because at, anyone can hear this information and we're going to dive more into it into part two, but anyone can hear information like this and go, okay, yeah, whatever. I guess I'll just like eat, you know, whatever I want. It doesn't really matter what the policy is because I'll just do my own thing. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, why policy matters is because it's baked into various parts of our lives and the ability to quote, eat whatever you want is also kind of a place of, um, you know, like privilege in a way, because if you have the energy and resources to look all this stuff up, then first of all, good to you, because it's a lot, as you said, took you 10 years, but also, um, you know, school lunches are based on these programs. Prison lunches are based on these programs. Um, state, uh, you know, uh, uh, senior living facilities are based on these programs. So not everyone has the freedom to eat whatever they want. Would you say that's true? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's one central nutrition policy that says there should be a one size fits all diet for everybody. There's no room for, for um, 
alteration, even though we, the science has really progressed to the point where it's extremely clear that people with metabolic diseases need a different kind of diet than for people who are healthy. People who are healthy can kind of, they can eat everything or they, you know, they can get away with it for a while. But, um, but people who are not well really cannot eat the same foods to the same abandon. And so we have this central nutrition policy and it controls, it controls so much more than I had originally thought when I got it, uh, started looking into it. it. It really, you know, whether or not it controls you or your loved ones really depends on the settings where you and your loved ones are eating. If you're in the, you know, if you have children in a public school or even a private school, um, so school lunches, feeding programs for the elderly, women and infant children, food baskets. I mean, you mentioned some of these. Um, but then there's the sort of the larger issue that all doctors, dietitians, nutritionists, um, so all healthcare people are schooled in this. So you go to your doctor and you say, you know, I'm doing this other kind of diet. And, the, you know, the doctor has been fed information to say that um, really to try to support the status quo. Um, there's you know, the, even the journals that doctors read are, are supported mainly by pharmaceutical companies. So they just, they, they don't favor a nutritional approach to getting healthy. And so, um, and that's a very uncomfortable position to be in. Um, you know, my mom, <laughs> when I tell her, you know, hey, how about having regular yogurt instead of that low fat yogurt with, you know, lots of sugary fruit in it. And she's like, yeah, honey, I guess I'll ask my doctor. And I want to say, you know, your doctor doesn't know about nutrition. But, you know, this, it is true that some of us are privileged to just feel strongly about what we're doing and to ignore, be able to ignore people who are naysayers, or we don't rely on public funding for our food, or we have a cafeteria at our workplace that has an abundance of different kinds of foods. Um, but many, many people, especially poor and underprivileged people in this country who have higher rates of all these diseases we're talking about, they do not have a choice. So, and that's, you know, and we as a nation have to pull together on this, you know, in the sense that like the military has missed its recruiting goals for the last three years in large part due to obesity. Wow. So if we want to have a functioning military, if we want our children to grow up and not be obese, if we do not want to continue to be our single greatest item of discretionary spending is the runaway diabetes costs. So, so it affects us, you know, all as a society in many ways. And that's, I think you summed it up perfectly of why it matters and why we should care, not just about our personal health and those that we love, but also about... Um, the policy. So as we wrap up this episode, uh, can you tell people where to find you and where they can find your lovely book? This bottom uh, half inch, by the way, folks, if you're watching this video, the bottom half inch of her book is all her cited sources. This is such an, I mean, I'm not even like getting it all right. It's, it's such a great book. So tell them where they can find thank it you. and you. Well, thank you for that. Um, the book is available on Amazon and um, and maybe other online sites. I don't know. But I, um, and I'm at ninateichels.com, which hopefully you'll be able to put in the show notes. And my non-for-profit organization that is working on nutrition policy, which is the only group anywhere in the world working to in, be a watchdog, basically, of, about the science and trying to ensure that our policy is evidence-based, that group is at nutritioncoalition.us. So anyone, and I'm on Twitter at Big Fat Surprise. Um, and that's where I actually am most active and post things. So you okay. can follow me there. Perfect. I'll put all of that in the show notes. Thank you Thank so you. much, Nina. This was amazing. Thank you.